Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. In honor of Native American Heritage Month, today Des Moines University welcomes Bill Birdsong Miller. Bill is an individual of many talents. He's a speaker, a storyteller, an artist, educator, and musician. Back by popular demand. He was here last year, and the campus really enjoyed him. How many of you were here last year? Great. What did you think last year? How about a clap to show the support? Yeah. Put some pressure on you, Bill. Anyway, Bill will share his life experiences uh, to help raise awareness on the health and wellness needs of the Native American community. Bill is an icon of the Native American American Indian music community, having won three Grammy Awards and an accomplished artist whose paintings are exhibited nationwide. His work has appeared in the National Museum of the American Indian Smithsonian Institution, the Barbara Abel Gallery in Santa Fe, the Trickster Gallery in Chicago, and the American Indian Community House Gallery in New York. Bill is also an Indie Man keynote speaker and lecturer, speaking at various colleges and universities on issues such as race relations, cultural awareness, and other topics like racial reconciliation, suicide prevention, alcohol and substance abuse, and health and wellness. Please join me in welcoming Bill Birdsong Miller to Des Moines University. Good to be back here again. I, I um, <laughs> thank you. drove up here in um, my old truck that I've had for years. I shouldn't have taken it out. I was going to rent a nice car. I usually, but I, I brought my uh, Nissan Pathfinder, 98 Pathfinder. It has 415,000 miles on it. And then uh, I was in South Carolina lecturing there last week, and it was 75 degrees and sunny there. It was beautiful, near Myrtle Beach. I didn't want to come up here, but I don't know, man. I might skip this lecture. And, um, but anyways, I made it up here, got, got some new tires on the way. Uh, I started observing um, the, uh, the, the weather channel and the roads and, and the weather up here, and I said, you know, I need to prepare for that. So I finally got tires on because I was getting spoiled in the south because you can hang on to bald tires for as long as possible because there's no snow or anything. And then I finally got some tires, and then uh, my heater went out, so I finally fixed that. So if you can believe it, I've I'm, I'm been driving for a week in this cold up here in the Midwest without a heater in my car, but finally got that going. So I'm in a very thankful mode today, very thankful to be here amongst you. And the beauty of it, uh, yesterday I was in a recording studio and with a friend of mine who's a producer, in lacrosse, he's worked on a couple of albums of mine who, that have won Grammys. He's an excellent human being. His wife is a doctor for Gunnarsson Clinic and works with Mayo Clinic, and, and she's very well known in the Midwest area. He's been a doctor for years. And uh, I'm, Mike had mentioned to his wife that I'd be speaking here, and, and she gave uh, an incredible nod to your college and said that the best medical people in the country are coming from Des Moines in this college, and that's the talk amongst the medical community out there in the real world. And so you guys got a lot to live up to. 
Uh, it used to be, you know, whatever it was, Chapel Hill. There were a lot of other campuses that are bringing out great doctors. But for some reason, they said uh, Iowa, Des Moines in particular, is putting out people of diversity and people who are seeing things the way they should be seen. And that's why I'm here to help uh, keep the foundation that Dr. Salas has already put down, and I am in so much agreement with him. He and I were talking today about um, health care, and uh, I asked him to write down some points because he, he has those great things to say. We merged on things, and, and um, he brought up how you guys are being taught what cultural response of care is, and I want to show you that today, uh, stuff that I didn't talk about last time. I'm going to bring up some other unique things about Native America but again, let me go back to real life. My sister is a doctor, and um, she's been a doctor for years. Her name is Stacy, and she has she's hair all the way down, almost to her ankles, and she's uh, somewhat of a traditional Native woman, but she's got her degree, and she's a doctor. And she was hired by the uh, Northern Cheyenne to work at their clinics up there, and then from there she went to the Crow Nation and worked with the Crow Indians, and from the Crow she went to Wyoming and worked with them. But during that period of years of working in those hospitals and clinics, she became a little depressed herself because if you think that um, all Native Americans are alike or that you're going to go into a community and it's going to be the same, it's, it's not. Each tribe was different for her. And here she's a Native woman who's a doctor, had to readjust to each culture because they didn't accept her. And it isn't like an, an, a, a racial thing, so to speak. It's just if they don't trust you, they're not going to let you in. So you have to learn about the culture you know, before you go into that. He, he, I was talking to, again, Dr. Salas about this. I, w I was thinking about how many times in other um, types of jobs do people have to really learn about who they are before they can go do what they're about to do. And even goes back to biblical times with uh, the Apostle Paul. I think he was Jewish at first, converted to Christianity, but he had to learn about the Greeks for years and study their culture, their foods, their philosophies before he did his job. And then last night I saw on National Geographic Channel uh, a special on uh, Green Berets and people within uh, Secret Service working in Colombia against the drug things. They have to spend years there to speak the language and learn the culture before they actually go out and actually can fight the battle. And think about what you're about to do. You're in the beginning stages, but you're actually, maybe you're not beginning, you're, you're in, in a point of flight, I would say, because as you become doctors and you're working in the real world, it's going to take years before you develop that rhythm and that clientele and the strength within your own hearts to become fully who you are. Your identity has to, has to come through. And right now, though, is the perfect time for you to start to put within your template and your learning process, your identity has to be strong enough to collect things. Meaning, it's a similar thing to music. Like, if I didn't know that um, what I was doing as far as a musician, I would have never won three Grammy Awards. But it took years to do that. And it's going to take years before you understand what your real uh, gifts are. Although some of you are very gifted now, what I encourage you to do is to uh, find your identity. Because a lot of people, even though they may wear the suit and tie or they, they are this and that and they claim this. Like I could claim that I'm a musician with three Grammys and I've toured with Pearl Jam and I did this and I did that. you know, But that's not me. And go deeper, well, I'm this and that. I'm a Native American. Well, that's my bloodline, but who, who am I? And in the spirit sense, you have to identify who you are before you can become uh, stronger in, in terms of the uh, street language, a badass. <laughs> You're not a badass until you know who you are. I used to um, fight, and my dad was a European boxing championship in the Army, and my brothers and I were all Golden Gloves boxing champs. And when we step into the ring, you're, you're fighting against a guy pretty much the same height, same weight, and sometimes the guys you're fighting against have, you know, 15, 20 fights, and you've got five. And you're looking at the records, and you're trying to identify yourself. It's, it's a wrong time, I can tell you this right now. If you're getting in the operating room, and you're about to do your first operation, and you're thinking, what the hell am I doing here? What, why did I do this, or why, why did I put all these years in it? You can't question. You've got to know who you are before you get there. So my coach used to tell me when we were training, it's easy to train when nobody's there. It's easy to hit the bag, but actually it's not easy because we had to learn how to hit a bag. Just like you're going to be learning how to hold certain tools, how to compose yourself in the middle of an operation or dealing with patients. You cannot lose your composure. 
Because guess what? People are victimized by cancer or by certain things or they're pregnant or whatever. They're, they want some strength from you. You got to come in there, like my coach used to tell me, Bill. You know, when we'd fight, he go, "You don't fight for victory here." I go, "What do you mean? I'm, I'm fighting for a win." He goes, "No, no, you don't fight for victory." I said, "Well, what do I do then?" He said, "You fight from victory." So when I come in the ring, I'm already victorious. I'm a champion. It doesn't mean I'm going to win that fight. It doesn't mean you're going to cure that cancer. It doesn't mean that something may go wrong. But it does mean you're going to be a, bring a victorious attitude into that room. Because that, that changes things. When you're in the ring and you're only a few inches from somebody and you're looking in their eyes, a victory came in the eyes. I, I could see a guy just losing it. And then you can just take over and be the badass you're supposed to be. And you win the fight. But if you don't fight from victory, you're never going to see it. You're going to be fighting for victory. It's going to be a battle all your life. You can't do that. You've got to walk in victorious and be confident in who you are. Your identity can't be your circumstances. So many people come in and they say, um, you know, I just got divorced or I just lost a baby. Or the, and you can read it. You can read it on people. I mean, you don't have to be a psychoanalyst or a doctor. I can read it in people's body language. They're victimized by their circumstance and their identity is lost in their circumstance. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and even in, and I'm not against 12-step programs, but I'm more into a holistic and a powerful way of medicine that can make people stronger on the bigger end than trying to go every Wednesday night and complain about men or, you know, being in abuse groups and hating men for the rest of life. Or every Wednesday night I'm going to bitch about alcohol and I'm going to bitch about... No. To me in that, that world, I would rather see people rather saying, Hi, my name is Bill and I'm an alcoholic. Or, Hi, my name is uh, Sarah and I'm a rape victim. Or, No, Sarah, you're a beautiful woman. No, Bill, you're a good man. No, Jim, you're, you're, you're good for today. You know, I've heard guys who haven't drank for 30 years still claim to be alcoholics. It's like, no, dude, you're not an alcoholic. When are you going to start saying, I am over this stuff? It does not control me. Because if you're identifying yourself that way, then you're identifying as, as a defeatist and a victim. But if you're going to wear the, the, the crown or the name as a doctor, and you're going to walk into my room, I don't want to talk to a lawyer. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't want to talk to an accountant. I want to see a doctor. And I want to see what you're made of because I may be in the last days of my life. I recently went through this with my mother who was the woman who took care of nine kids. I'm the oldest of nine kids through an alcoholic, abusive father who died of alcoholism on the reservation, my father. And she died this April. And I was with her for six months in and out of hospice care, hospitals, and, and extra. And there were three doctors who uh, took care of her and eventually came down to two doctors and eventually came to one doctor. And uh, nurses caring for my mother. But I tell you what, these doctors were excellent. And I mean this because they gave my mother back her dignity. They, they, they didn't make false promises. They didn't give her false hope. They gave her real human hope. They let my mom be Lenore Miller. They let Lenore Miller, uh, in the middle of something, my mom would say when the doctor was sort of analyzing a few things, my mom saw me walk in the room one night, and she goes, oh, Billy. And the doctor stopped and says, you need to hug Bill. And she goes, yes. That's powerful. My mom held me, and the doctor said, I'll come back tomorrow and talk to you, Lenore. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Where, where are your priorities at? And I want to tell you that your skill systems can only go so far inside this building. What's going to happen is you're going to have to carry them outside the building. You're going to have to deal with a lot of things that are going to pressure you. But the deal is, if you don't clean up your own house, your own act, and you can't handle your own family or your own life, I don't want you coming in an operating room. You understand? I want you stabilized before you walk into the ring. And so many times, we don't know what we're observing. Because what we observe is what we interpret, and what we interpret is how we apply our lives. Those three things, observation, interpretation, application. I learned those things from elders in a tribe when I was 16 years old. And I've never left them behind. And um, the, I learned how to bow hunt is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to show you something that, that really it applies to all of us. When, when I went to this hunting camp when I was 16, I, did, I had no idea. I thought we were going to just shoot arrows at a target and go deer hunting with a bunch of older Indian guys. But it was much more than that. There was about five or six of us 16-year-old Indian guys in northern Wisconsin went to the camp. And uh, the elders said, okay, we're going to tell you something. Because we were all chattering like 16-year-olds do. But uh, I see college kids around here. You're chattering too all the time. 
And they said, listen, you're going to have to be quiet. And we sort of quieted down. Then, then they finally said, you're going to have to shut up. And we go, what? And they said, for the next two weeks, when you're with us, we don't want to hear one word out of you. Do you understand it, Mr. Miller? I go, huh? And uh, they told all the other kids, they said, no, just shut up. And I go, what? And he said, if you be quiet and observe, you're going to learn a lot. Just be quiet. And then they started to teach us. We had to follow them. They made the bows by hand. They had the, the bow uh, beautifully carved. And then they would shoot and they would put clothes on. They would track deer. They would do all sorts of things in those two weeks that we had to really be quiet. I wanted to ask a lot of questions, but instead, because I wasn't asking, because I was observing and being respectful and learning, that's what you're going to have to do other cultures, it's stuck. The data never erases. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, oh, better erase this. Get rid of the history of this. You can't do that when it's done person to person, people to people, master to learner. And man, I learned so much from them. So by the end of the two weeks, we went into the interpretation stage. The interpretation stage was <coughs> where they said, now you can talk to us. Now you can ask us questions. But this was the deal. They said, don't ask us the same question twice. So you think about what you're about to ask us. It was like, what? There again, a kid has a hard time not saying the same thing twice. But you learn from that. And when I learned how to hunt, then I became a deer hunter. So ask yourself during your days of studying and during your days of um, going for the, the, uh, not the end of the journey, actually once you graduate, it's the beginning of your, of your journey of your life. It's just you're going towards the beginning. It's not over. You've got a long ways to go. But ask yourself during these times, really, what are you putting in? What are you observing besides the stuff you have to read, besides the stuff you have to watch, besides the stuff you have to listen to at college? In those times in between, as a master, as I'm a master musician, you're a master doctor, what are you putting in yourself? What are you observing? Are you observing excellence? And I'm not saying you have to observe everything medical, because you do that all day. But in your off time, are you observing something of excellence or crap? Are you observing abuse? Because when I started realizing this, when I grew up on the reservation, uh, five guys uh, who were on... Uh, my neighborhood block on the reservation, we didn't know that each one of our fathers was abusing our mothers, beating us up too, because we were the oldest sons, until I joined the football team, and uh, men's locker rooms are gross. Anyway, they stink, and there's no, there's no privacy in a men's bathroom. It's, you're all going to stand by each other, undress, and all. It's just weird. And, and so me and these five guys playing the same football team, and notice we had bruises on before we even started playing football. And eventually we ask each other, where'd you get that bruise, man? My dad hit me. My dad hit me. And then we start talking about what we observed in the weeks to come. And it was terrifying. My dad was thrown in jail. My dad was in jail too. My dad beat mom up last night. My dad beat her up the other night. So after a while, how do I interpret that? After all I, I'm trying to see excellence, I see pain. I interpreted myself as lower than you. I interpreted life as suicidal. I interpreted that I'm a loser. I'm never going to make it. All men are evil. All women are weak. Whatever. That's the interpretation. Wrong. When I started to see excellence, things changed for me. When I started to watch things and see things, I focused on it. And you know what? That's what got me my Grammys. That's what makes things come through. And it isn't just for musicians. It isn't just for Native Americans or Indian people. It's for you. And I swear to God, if you observe excellence whether it be a sporting event or even if you even watch something on TV or you watch a bird fly or you, watch, you get up early enough to see the sun rise or it to set or you watch, go to McDonald's or some restaurant and watch a father hold his son or, or a couple loving on each other in public and not being afraid or watching somebody break down on their knees and pray or watching somebody finish something or watch a race or see excellence. Do your best to fill your... Your, your time, your gaps in your studying to at least devote a part of your day to excellence. You understand what I'm saying? Because if you get in that habit, you're going to be the doctors that are going to be the ones that are not going to see the BMW as the ultimate goal. What, what you're going to see is doctors who want to cure cancer. There were doctors that did that to smallpox and all they did the rest of their life was devote themselves, I'm going to get this disease, I'm going to kick its butt. 
And that is pursuing excellence. But you can't just start doing that without pursuing excellence on a smaller level. But when you see excellence, excellence, there's no level. I, I, there's excellence in my relationship. Now it's been two years with Dr. Salas. I see him as an excellent human being. <laughs> he has excellence in him. And I, I'm, I'm very impressed by him. And I'm impressed by your teachers here and this university. If I can go out to the public, which they don't even know that I'm speaking here, and I can sort of ask doctor friends of mine. I said, they asked me, they said, where are you touring? I said, well, I'm going to be over at Des Moines. I'm speaking at this. And they said, dude, they're putting out the best doctors in the country. <laughs> it's like, so know that your, your name is getting out there. So you have to follow excellence. And, and I would say to build yourself up that way. And don't waste your time. Uh, I'm going to bring up something. This is really interesting. With native people now, if you looked on a map, I don't have a map here, but if I were to show you a map, I come from the northern, uh, northeastern tribes, uh, woodland tribes. My tribe is Mohican. Now, some people from out here are Plains Indians. There's northern plains, and then you go to the coast, and you get west coast Indians. And you can categorize each tribe, and they're similar. Southwestern tribes, southeastern tribes, they're similar. They look similar. Their languages are somewhat similar. So you can base it on that. But in the Plains Indians, uh, they, they hunted buffalo. We hunted deer and, um, and earlier elk and stuff. But we had the same philosophy. But let me give you an example of how you can see how people don't, Indian people don't waste things. This is one buffalo. And uh, I've been involved with um, a buffalo hunt one time. I went on, on one with these guys, and we ate the buffalo meat that night over a fire. And, but I, I didn't see him do all this stuff. But let's say a buffalo, what do they do with the meat? What do they do with the hide? What do they do with the horns? What do they do with the skull? What do they do with the hair? What do they do with the wool? Those are all things laying there. Now, if you've ever seen those pictures of some of the guys that went out to hunt with Wild Bill Hickok and those guys, they used to shoot hundreds and hundreds of buffalo just for the hell of it. And they would leave things wasting on the land when the Indian people were herding on these reservations for food. Well, the meat is taken immediately fresh and cut down and butchered, and half is whatever, uh, how much they need to eat fresh is eaten fresh, and the other parts are smoked and saved for the, throughout the year. The hide of the buffalo is used for clothing, moccasins, teepees, and blankets. The buffalo horns, this is a 2,000-pound animal, too, by the way. The horns were used for spoons, for cups, powder horns, tools, toys, ornaments. The skull is used uh, to this day for a ceremonial prayer item in ceremonies. The hair and the wool were used for ropes, halters, pillows, pads, and bracelets. The brain of the buffalo is used to, uh, the chemicals are used to tan and soften the hide. Um, the teeth were used for games and ornaments. The tails were used for whips, fly swatters, and even the buffalo chips. I'm not talking chips with dip, but, you know, the cow chip, but the buffalo chips were used for fuel, fire, and for a baby powder. <laughs> Isn't that wild? And the fat was used uh, for um, hair, uh, and I've seen them do this on the Crow Reservation, because I wonder how some of these Indians out there, they have thick, thick black hair, and uh, they don't have um, Moroccan oil out there on the res, but... And they don't have conditioner, but they, they use the, the fat from different animals. Bear and buffalo fat have a certain conditioner, and they put it in their hair. And then they, they, uh, it helps their hair. They use it like shampoo and stuff. And, um, and then the sinew is used, which is the stringy muscle fiber in a buffalo's uh, body, and they use that for bowstrings and for thread. That's a lot of things to use from one animal. So I encourage you to know that each one of you in this room is gifted, and very gifted. And you're very blessed to be where you're at. You're the, you're the, you're the ones that are going to change the world. You really are. You're facing an era now with incredible uh, issues about health care, and right now issues about um, illegal immigrants and immigrants and people that are struggling with health issues and uh, immigration issues and, and needing things, people that are hiding out. People that are uh, losing jobs, gaining jobs, you're in a high position. And I don't want you to, first of all, lose your identity. And, first, and, and second of all, I want to encourage you to continue on in a masterful way to heal. If we, um, 
look at some of the issues amongst uh, Native America, there there's some tough ones. Um, isolation isn't good for anybody, and a lot of reservations are isolated areas. And within that isolated area, you can imagine people are alone, whether they be elderly or, or youth, and things can happen. Uh, we have um, virtually on a lot of reservations, especially up in Canada, but in the north, and even in the south and southwest, there's no electricity, no internet, no Wi-Fi. Um, the unemployment rate is 50 to 70 percent. We have the lowest average income in the United States. Um, we're surrounded by environmental destruction, um, lack of good education, uh, the poverty. The social challenges are shortage of housing and their health issues, a lot of heart disease and diabetes, they are commonplace amongst American Indians. Um, <coughs> we have uh, the highest rate of high school dropouts in the United States, 54%. We have the highest rate of infant mortality. We have the highest rate of suicide in the world per capita of races. There's no race, which I hate to say we're the top dogs in suicide, but we are. There's no race that beats us in suicides. Why is that? I don't know. We have the highest rate of teen suicides, 18.5 per 100,000. That's heavy duty. And I had to go in 1995. I was flown by Warner Brothers when I was out on tour with Pearl Jam. I flew back from a tour because six kids on the reservation border in Minot, Wisconsin, had hung themselves over the weekend. Totally separate. They didn't even know it. Six kids. It was in the USA Today. USA Today covered Wyoming and Wisconsin and only suicides going on with these kids. Why? Why? We have mental health issues. You know, this is interesting. Um, I went through a lot... Uh, a few years back, and I'm not going to go into details, but there were some tragic things within my own family. Deaths and certain things like similar things. And it, it broke my heart. And it was about six years ago. And I, 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 I'm a human being. <laughs> so are you. So be prepared. Be strong. Yeah, I was winning. I'd won my first Grammy, but I was broken. I was broken from these family issues. So I admitted that I was mentally ill. I felt suicidal. I was sick, but I wasn't sick. So I went to my tribe and I said, listen, I, I, I need to go to some health care center that deals with Native issues. And they said, well, there's one in Minneapolis. And I said, well, is there any money allotted for tribal members for health issues? They said, yes, we have $2,800 per tribal member. There's only 1,500 tribal members. I said, wow, that's awesome. And I went for two weeks and I got counseled. I got healed. Actually, it, it brought me back my life. And then I went back to the tribe and I said, well, how many other Indians in our tribe are actually using this mental health money? They said, zero. You're the first one in 10 years. I go, are you kidding me? They said, no. Nobody wants to admit on this reservation they're sick. You understand what I'm saying? People in minorities sometimes were so broken and so poor and so downtrodden that we don't even want to tell our own people we're, we're, because we're filled with shame or we think we can take it. Now, on our reservation, and I know this to be in certain farming communities, some people get stubborn. When they're so sick, they don't come into a doctor until there's something growing out of their shoulder. They wait till the last minute when they're about to die. Now, if you can change this template, you can make sure these families that you are in touch with don't do that anymore. You can change the world. You can tell these people, listen, I, I, I want to see you alive. I want to see you, I want to see you have grandchildren. I want to see you. Encourage people. Especially the broken. Listen, because I, I, you don't, guess what? They don't hear that. We don't, I didn't hear that. I never heard, hey, Bill, I want to see you win a Grammy someday. Bill, I want to see you alive. I want to see you make it in the world. Hell no, I didn't get that. I, want, I, I only got spit on and told, hey, chief, I hope you die in a freaking ditch. I hope you drink yourself to death. You're a worthless piece of crap. That's what we get in our neighborhoods, and I can't imagine what it's like in the inner city or the ghettos when people are coming at you. They're surely not coming up to every black child saying, listen, I want you to make it in this world. I encourage you. My prayers and thoughts are with you. Bull crap. It ain't happening. You have that opportunity. You understand what I'm saying? You have an opportunity besides legalism or saying your bill is going to be $600 for picking out the toothpick out of your tongue. You know, whatever. <laughs> no, you have an opportunity to encourage somebody. You have an opportunity to give them hope because guess what? You are on a higher level. And I'm, and I'm proud of you. I'm proud to see you be students. I'm proud to see you because I'm in the same area you are. I'm in a healing zone. 
I made it out of an alcoholic home, oldest of nine children. I made it out of beatings, torture. My dad trapped me. In my, I don't even want to tell you what happened to me. But I made it out of it, you know, because I kept seeking excellence. And you know what? I can do a two-minute, 50-second song and blow people's minds and win a Grammy and make them want to get married or make them want to cry or make them want to go to war. Or like, I can rock with Pearl Jam and make you want to dance. And there's healing going on. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I'm part of that healing process. My purpose here is to bridge not only culture but arts and that beautiful human resource that we all have together with medicine. Now, if we take doctors and keep hooking that gap up that's in the medical world that I see with, with that cultural diversity going on that needs to be focused on, and you know who comes in the middle of that gap? It's lawyers and accountants. And they're, they're more than willing to come talk to you and to your patients to get more gigs. And, and it's like, no, I like to tell the lawyers and accountants, do your own job and do it good, but stay out of my job. I mean, I've got lawyers and accountants doing the music industry. I don't like them either. I mean, I, I need them. You know, go get my royalties and stuff, but stay the hell off my stage. They can't sing. They suck. You know? <laughs> and you think these lawyers or these other guys can actually come in and do a brain surgery? Baloney. They can't do that. They can't deliver a baby. They're who they are. Stop putting your energy in that zone and start putting it where the people are because that's where the healing comes. I swear to God, once you get your first operation or once you get your first patient and you see success in this, you're going to feel so powerful, good. But keep it humble. Humility is what's going to heal your, your patients and it's going to keep you strong. Humility, you know what humility is? It's power under control. That's humility. Power under control. You've got a lot of power. You guys are all, in my mind, once you get out of here and you start making it, and there are doctors in here right now, these guys are six-degree black belts, dudes. They can kick your ass. But do they do that? Do they go in the hall and, and you come into their class, they go, hey, come here. You're wrong. You know, start slapping you up and telling you you're screwed up. I don't think so. But some of you do need a slap in the head. But, um, <laughs> but they don't do it, you know. They, they'll try to encourage you. If you're really a powerful person, the last thing I want to do is to punch somebody's face out. I don't want to do it. That's the last thing. In fact, in the, in the, in the long run, um, you need to, to take your wings and learn how to rise above. Now, I can't remember if I told this story last time. Was it the Rise Above the Storm with Golden Eagles? Well, get this. I was doing a, a film soundtrack in Montana. It's about 15 years ago uh, for uh, public television. And beautiful part of the world, Montana. And I went out for a break with this guy in his pickup truck. He was an ornithologist. And I don't know if you know what an ornithologist is, but it's not a doctor, but it's a <laughs> maybe a doctor of birds. I don't know. But it's a, uh, a scientist of studying birds. And, and I'm an amateur ornithologist. I love birds. And he said, Bill, I want to show you something. There's a storm coming in uh, this afternoon, and the winds are up to 60 miles an hour. He said, let's go out in the canyons and check out the birds that are going to get blowing around. I said, okay. So we sat in his truck and we watched the winds come in and we watched all kinds of species of birds. He said, okay, well, what kind of birds did you see? We started naming all these songbirds. And then in Montana, there's a bird called a magpie. It's like a crow, but it's got long tail with white feathers. It's a beautiful bird, kind of odd bird. And we saw red-tailed hawks. But you know what the deal was? When the wind came in, these birds, there's a lot of ponderosa pines and stuff. The birds got into the trees immediately, which I would do, to protect yourself from the storm. They all got, even the hawks, they got down and curled in away from the storm, and they got out of the sky. So he said, well, there's, there's a bird that you didn't see that reacts to the wind quite differently than that. I said, what's that? He says, a golden eagle. I said, okay. He said, there's two golden eagles, and they mate for life, and they hunt in this valley, but they're not here for some reason. So let's go up a little further and see if we can find them. Sure enough, we saw these golden eagles just floating in this canyon. And they're beautiful birds, and in the female golden eagle, they are much bigger than a male. A uh, female golden eagle's wingspan is sometimes as long as wide as 10 feet across. Can you imagine that? That's big. And um, you don't, the golden eagles are very solitary compared to bald eagles. Bald eagles are beautiful. They're our country's, uh, you know, symbol with the white head and the white feathers and stuff. But the, the, gold, the bald eagles, they hang around in groups of hundreds. I mean, they'll go down and eat fish. They'll eat garbage. They'll go down with bears. They just, they're fun, fun eagles, you know, whatever. They're big birds. <laughs> they're sort of like... You know, like your student lounge, a bunch of bald eagles. <laughs> but then there's the, the golden eagle, which is like 
the student that's going to cure cancer someday, they're off in another corner. They don't want to talk with you because they're too busy. You know, they're working on their thing. And the golden eagles are like that. They're, they're separatists. But the beauty of them, they were gliding towards me, and that 60-mile-an-hour wind kicked in. He says, Bill, watch what the golden eagle does. I said, okay. And, man, when that 60-mile-an-hour wind hit the golden eagle, that eagle turned to face the wind instinctively. They, they locked their wings, and when the wind hit both of them, they went straight up. Not sideways, not backwards. They went straight up. Unbelievable. Some people didn't believe me. I said, go to YouTube, dude, and look up golden eagles in a, in a storm. And there's film footage showing eagles going straight up. That blows my mind. This man, this Indian ornithologist, American Indian, he said, remember that, Bill. And I was thinking at the time, why? It's cool, but why should I remember that? What an idiot. <laughs> and then the winds hit me, and I realized that I need to strengthen myself because the first time I faced my storms, like we all get storms. You're all going to get storms in your life. I don't know what it's going to be, but you're going to hit a storm. And, and I thought, well, well, good. I'll just uh, be a man about it and I'll face the storm and I'll just lock my wings and, and it'll be all over. You know, boom, I did that and boom, my wings blew off. You know, And uh, I wasn't spiritually ready. You guys have the time now to build up your spiritual muscles, your, 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 your social Muscles, your um, connective uh, creativ- creativity muscles, your uh, communication muscles. You have a chance to um, get your wings to the point where you're not going to get them blown off. And when you face issues <coughs> that are negative and are too harsh, uh, remember this. This is in your personal life first, not just in the operating room. But if you face issues in your personal life that are too harsh, they're going to wreck your career because they can wreck your career. You need to rise above it. Because for the most part, you won't face that kind of stuff in your medical life. I I swear to God, you won't. You'll face some negative cancer. You'll face some negative things that are going to come at you 100 miles an hour. But for the most part, people are going to depend on you. But in the other part of the world, your daily thing going to Starbucks, you might just face some creep or... You might have a creepy brother-in-law. I don't know. You're going to go through stuff that's going to hit you hard. And that's the stuff in my career that hurt my music because when, you're, when you can't face stuff and you try to solve stuff that you shouldn't even be involved in, it starts wrecking your attitude. And I couldn't get on stage during my hard times I told you about. I couldn't even tour. I didn't want to sing. I didn't want to paint. I, I was depressed. I was angry. I was trying to deal with stuff. I wasn't rising above the storm. As soon as I faced that and let the wind hit me and I rose above it, Things happened. The doors opened up. I became strong again. And I I believe in that to the point of um, wanting to share that with you and and knowing that um, these things are sacred. You know, in in the American Indian world, you ever heard the term medicine man? You know, uh, some of the New Agers call it shamanism or whatever. But I want to base my healing uh, and my my teachings to you that I'm going to show a couple things that are very sacred to me on our culture, not a New Age culture. So just understand, we don't get our teachings from hippies, from hell. You know, People who do sweat lodges and charge rich white people in Phoenix and, and kill them. You know what I'm saying? These are some strange people out there. You know, <clears throat> I don't dance with those people. Okay, <laughs> I won't. This uh, is a sacred pipe, and uh, this pipe stem comes from Pipestone, Minnesota, the only place in the world with catlinite. Well, we already knew what it was, but of course the white man always has to name something after himself. <laughs> we were already using some, and George Catlin came to this quarry and said, oh, wow, there's a bunch of red stone there, and these Indians are making pipes and stuff. My name is Catlin. I'll call it catlinite. So it's called catlinite. But anyways, it's Pipestone to us. And this pipe stem... And this, this pipe stem and this pipe are put together. Now, when we do a ceremony, and I'm not always allowed to tell, so I'm telling you this in here. I don't tell a lot of people this, but there's a certain <clears throat> way to do this. You have to pray sacredly. It is sacred things. This is not filled with anything but um, tobacco that is either harvested by Native Americans or gone through uh, things, regular tobacco or sacred tobacco. There's no weed, no marijuana ever smoked in a Native American holy pipe. So a lot of people think, oh man, you guys, you had a good life. You Indians were getting high all the time. No, we weren't getting high. (laughs) You guys were getting high. (laughs) 
trying to imitate us in the 60s, wearing long hair and everything, beads, you guys pretending to be Indians. No. <laughs> Wrong thing. This, this, is a, this is an altar. And, uh, and it's a male and female part. So we have to pray to our Creator and ask if we can pray. And so we spend time doing that. And, and as we ask, I would feel something. And I, I pray with my pipe every other month or sometimes every other week. It depends on the feelings I get. It's like almost like you get in a call at night. You better come in. So-and-so is very sick. I'll get a, 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 a jolt in my spirit that tells me I need to pray for somebody. So when I do, I ask if I can pray. And if I get a negative feeling, no, then I don't do it. But if I get a positive, then I join the male and female parts. Then I take this and I take it out and I point the stem to the sacred six directions. Uh, the sacred six directions are first to the heavens, to the creator, and then I, I turn it around to myself and, and then empty it out again and then down to the earth, which was created by the creator, and then to the north, south, east, and west. And once I'm done with the directions, then I take the pipe and I am ask an elder to fill it for me. He fills it with pipe tobacco. We start the ceremony and it goes around and we share this and pray it until that tobacco is burned out. But we don't smoke it as a uh, you know, a recreational smoke. It's, it's definitely prayer. Because what you do is when you see the smoke coming out of not only your mouth but this pipe, you're seeing the prayers and the breath of you and the Creator in the real. You know what I'm saying? It, we take things very literally as well as spiritually. And when the combination comes, there, there's healing that's to be done. We know it's a done deal. And to me, that connects so much with the medical world because you're actually, <clears throat> you're going to get to a point where you're not just working on a cadaver, you're working on a human being. And you're going to see blood flowing. You're going you're to feel things. You're going to have to be strong. There's a soul and a spirit in front of you. What are you going to do with that? And yours is pumping too. It's heavy. That's heavy. So I want you to understand it's not only heavy, it's sacred. You're in a sacred spot. You're in a life and death situation. You are the ones that are going to change the world. You are the healers. You're the future of our nation and our nation's health. The world is looking at us right now in odd ways. Maybe they're thinking, can you Americans make it? Well, I think it's all going to come from you, from our health care because our people need to be healed. There's a lot of sick people out there. Emotionally, cancer-wise, they're eating the wrong foods. We're, we're, we're not doing the right things for ourselves. And our spirits aren't guiding us. So I want you to know that I'm here because I love the medical world. My sister is a doctor. I've, I've gone to real doctors, but I've been healed by medicine men. Not shaman, by medicine men. I've been touched by prayer and, and things have happened to me. And maybe you could say, well, that's positive elements. It should be. We should all treat each other well. What if every day that somebody saw you and said, man, I dig your hair, man. I like your, I like your shirt, man. I, uh, man, good looking shoes. And every day you hear that, wouldn't you be the one that's feeling good? I see people. And then, and then you get somebody else who never gets compliments or walk around. Do you like my hair? And they don't say nothing, you know. And nobody talks to that girl. And nobody smiles at that girl. Nobody touches her hand. Nobody gives her a hug. But there's... Certain people, we all need it. I don't care how fat you are, how skinny you are, how tall you are, how blonde you are, how red you are, whatever. Why can't you have the guts? If you've got the guts to go to medical school, if you've got the guts to hang in there for that many years and to put all your money and effort in and try to make your parents and your family proud or whatever you're, you're into, you don't have the guts to reach out to somebody and heal before you get into the operating room? Take advantage of it. It'll lift you up. Because when you're in there, your spirits are going to get attacked. You're going to get worn out. I get worn out on the stage. Seriously. Touring wears you out. You're in a bus. You're in a plane. You're traveling. You're in a freaking hotel. The pillows are different every night. Your neck hurts. You're, you're being asked to take drugs. You don't want to take them. There's groupies. There's weirdos. And it comes time that you're doing your song. And you can't wait for that moment. But you're so freaking worn out. It's like, oh, I don't know if I can do it. But you do it because the spirit is in you. I don't have my flesh guiding me anymore, running my life. That's emotions. Emotions are very real. They're 100% real. They're not the truth. I'm guided by a spirit. And that's what we should be. So I've only got a few minutes. Can I do a couple tunes on that? Uh, I wish I had more time with you because I would love to spend the last university. Um, this is my, my healing fan. Actually, this was given to me. This, these are all eagle feathers. Um, if you want to come up and see my flutes and the feathers and the pipes, come on up uh, after the lecture. But um, I wish I had more time with you. At the last university I had, they gave me, I was the last thing of the day. 
So I had actually, the kids wouldn't leave for like 35, 40 minutes, and they asked me all sorts of questions. But if you ever have any questions, just get to Dr. Salas, and he'll email me anything. You are in, this university is in my prayers. The last time I came here, I was so touched by your students and so um, encouraged when I see the media talking about the medical society or, or other people reading, it's a lot of negatives or it's a lot of this and that. I'm, I'm sickened by it. Uh, I'm encouraged to come into your college. I'm encouraged to see you working hard to make a change. I'm encouraged to see you put your spirit, your mind, your body into it. That's diversity. And our, our people, American Indians, need you. We do. We need you. Our lives suck. I'm saying, I was like, hi, dude, I'm Greek. Really, are you? No, not, but a, in a past life, I was a Greek. Right. Okay, buddy. This, um, I didn't write this, and I didn't want to do, I have enough time to do songs I've written, but uh, the reason I'm going to do this song, because it, it, it goes along with a lecture, it was written by a good friend of mine, his name is Tommy Sims. He's an African-American songwriter, and his whole life changed when he wrote this freaking song that's three minutes and 20 seconds long. And uh, he became a millionaire, not quite overnight, but almost overnight. It rocked his world pretty hard. He, he went back into his old ways for a bit, but then he came out of it in, in a powerful way. And, and the song ended up getting into Eric Clapton's hands, and then it ended up being in a movie. And movie soundtracks are huge for royalties. But I like the chorus, I like the words, because... It's, it's what you've got to carry on through your life. It's what I carry, is that you can change the world, even just one of you, especially in the medical world. Um, maybe not working at McDonald's asking if you want bigger fries, but in your, in your job, you're going to change the world. You're going to keep these people from eating too much McDonald's. <laughs> you're going to stop them from getting the exercise, you know, whatever that is. You've you got to have the courage. Please have the courage and the strength to, to protect yourself in the midst of the healing, okay? Look out for yourself. Get your identity back. Take care of yourself. You're no, or you're no good for us. You don't understand what I'm saying? You really got to take care of yourself. And be a strong victor. Don't fight for victory. Fight from victory. Hope you can hear this. Does that sound okay? Too loud or not loud enough? Up? Oh, scary. <coughs> I don't know if the vocal's up that loud, is it? If I could reach the stars, I'd pull one down for you. I'd shine it on my heart, baby. So you could know the truth That this love I have Is everything it seems But for now I know It's only in my dream That I could change the world be the sunlight in your universe. You think my love is really something good. Baby, if I could, you know I'd change. I'd change this world. If I could be a king. Even for just one day, I'd have you as my queen, I'd have it no other way, and this kingdom we'd rule with everything we made, till then I'd be a fool, just wishing for that day. When I could change
changed the world. I'd be the sunlight in the universe. You'd think my love was really soft and good. Baby, if I could, you know I'd change. Babe, I'd change, I'd change. Oh, I'd change the world. Thank you so much. I do one part of a traditional song because that's all I got. And do I have time for just a couple minutes? This song in my language is, um, uh, it was in a Lou Diamond Phillips movie. I, I wrote it in 1993. And um, it's called Praises. And I'm saying, Anishinaabe, Menetahem, Wawanan, Manikako, Satowa, Satowa, Wawanan, Mamakoneno, Mamakoneno. It means, uh, we the people, we thank you for we have everything we need. We thank you, our Father. We thank you, our Father above. We feel good in our hearts. We thank you. We thank you, our, our Father up above. It's as simple uh, of a prayer of thankfulness as you can get. And I want you to, and I'm sure you are, but sometimes I believe we have to remind ourselves. You guys need to remind yourself. When I, even when I drove in here and I can see you, um, I'm in a thankful mood. I'm in a happy mood. Someone asked me if I was high the other day at another campus. I said, no, I'm just happy. I'm, not high. I'm happy my heater's working. I'm happy I got new tires on my old piece of crap car. I'm happy to be in Des Moines. I'm just thankful. Are you thankful you're here at Des Moines College? Are you ha- thankful? You you better be. You better know that you're in a good place. You're about to be launched into a career that means more than a career. It's gonna you're gonna save people's lives. You're gonna save people's lives. You're gonna save families. You're gonna change the world. How many people get that opportunity to do that and get paid for it? That's like being a professional bass fisherman. Come on. I'd love to get paid for going fishing. You're going to get, you're going to get paid to change the world. Realize that. I know it's hard, the studies and the uh, sacrifices you have to make to get through medical school and the emotional turmoils you have to face, but they're nothing in comparison to cancer. They're nothing in comparison. So you're going to be strong. I want you to be strong. I want you to be thankful and content in all things because when your contentment comes through, the uh, courageousness of a warrior from our heritage to yours, I hope it applies to you. You know, Walk in with a warrior attitude, okay? This song is, is a traditional song. in the streams I praise you for the eagle the visions and the dreams the visions and the dreams the visions and the dreams we are yeah hey I wish you now on a time yeah yeah hey yeah 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 yeah
I know time is of essence now. Thank you uh, for coming. One more big round of applause for Bill Miller.